Hey everybody, Adam Savage from Tested here in my cave. And one of the most underappreciated yet important parts of filmmaking is the sound design. Sound designers, sound mixers, and Foley artists all work in concert with each other to create a soundscape for every scene in a movie, for every beat of every scene in a movie. It is world building all on its own. Recently, I visited our friends at Skywalker Sound where Samson Nesland, one of the sound designers for Thor Love and Thunder, broke down for me just how many different sounds go into creating the soundscape for a key scene in a major Marvel film. And frankly, it blew my mind. Hello, Samson, it's Hello. good to see you. Good to see you too. Uh, tell me where we are right now. We are uh, we are at Skywalker Ranch. We are in Mix E. Um, this is uh, mix stage, one of our six mix stages here, and this is where uh, the mixer comes and mixes sound to picture. So the picture comes up on this screen, and the mixer sits here and and right. adjusts and arranges all the sounds that are. That's right. Moves it around the room, adds uh, reverb and um, EQ if necessary, and sub, and just kind of make it feel like a like a movie. Okay, so you are a sound designer. Yes. Now, I come from the uh, 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 visual and making aspect, so I know that when a production designer meets with a director, I kind of understand how that breakdown goes of the director's vision of how the film is gonna look, but walk me through how a sound designer's first meeting with a director goes. How does a director implement their vision for the sound of a film to you? That's a great question, yeah. Um... I mean, we start off with this with a spotting session mm -hmm. with the director. And uh, what is a spotting session? Spotting session is basically where we go to a room, maybe some somewhere like this, and they go through the movie mm -hmm. um, scene by scene and kind of focus on the elements that they that are important to them or certain key sounds that they're interested in. And, and from that, you kind of start getting idea an idea of what they're going for, mm -hmm. kind of their overall um their overall view or direction of of the film um and then you know with certain films with marvel films you already have a certain expectation right. with what it's supposed to be or how it's supposed to be but there's always different kind of uh flair or uh different layer that you're gonna be doing um with a particular director is the sound designer brought in before the film is shot or after the film is shot um it, it kind of varies, but often it's it's during the shoot. Okay. It's during the shoot and maybe right afterwards. That's when you start talking with the director, start talking with the, the picture team, and they'll start asking for things for early work or ideas, and you'll start sending, sending sounds, and then they'll start either uh, giving you feedback on it or integrating it into their cut. And then you just continue work, that working relationship and kind of getting a feel for each other. I will tell you when I, because I watch a lot of YouTube, when I watch videos of how sound designers do their work, and I specifically like I drift towards Marvel films, yeah. I'll see a scene and I'm just overwhelmed by the sheer volume yeah. of sounds that you guys have to deal with. <laughs> you must get that at the beginning of a project feeling like, I don't know how we're going to do all oh, of yeah, this. Oh yeah, totally. <laughs> and, and even reading the script, you know, early on reading the script and you're, you know, there's always, with the Marvel films, there's all these legacy sounds. There's all these, you know, iconic sounds that people have used, that these awesome designers have created right. uh, over the past. But there's always new places, new characters, new weapons, like a huge amount of those things. And so it, it is overwhelming. You start by, you know, I mean, the best way I found is just make, start making a list of the things. Okay, we need to hit this. We probably have enough stuff for that. This is totally new. That's a totally new world. That's, you know. So it's just we're, list, 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 yeah, list. Yeah, yeah. We have to knock all these things out somehow. We have to find a, a way to get it all done. All right, Simpson, what are we about to watch here on the screen? Yeah, this is just a scene from Thor Love and Thunder. It's the, the one of the battles, one of the early battles at New Asgard. And I'm just going to play you the, the dialogue without any effects or oh, uh, backgrounds or anything. I like love that. that. Oh, awesome. Take Ziff to the infirmary. Hey, who'd you piss off now? It's not my fault. I've never even seen these things, whatever the hell they are. Welcome back. <laughs> so that's a little snippet of that. 
So this, the sound, just people's dialogue. This is how you get the footage? Yeah, uh, basically. This is, this, is the, um, this is a cleaned up production yeah. track, but yeah. it's, uh, you know, we're, we're starting with basically nothing in here. Um, the, the, picture to, the picture team do temp in certain things that they think would work, yeah. and so we have access to what they're doing, but essentially we're starting, starting new on this. I'm surprised that I don't even hear like people breathing. Right. Like exhalations of breath after an action. Even that is stuff that you layer in after the fact. Yeah, it's a lot of building from the ground up for something like this. Now, with something like this with all the people on screen, do they grab you actual sound of this on set that you can use if you want to? Yeah, they have a, they have recording of uh, their reactions, mm -hmm. but uh, often we'll, we supplement them with uh, size and... Um, you know, different textures and things that they, we can layer in. Okay. Um, and just kind of support the size and the emotion of it. Can we hear this with just the effects? Of course. <laughs> Now I'm noticing something there in that there's all these big sounds and there's all these different things, but there's definitely like a rhythm to it. Mm. There's definitely like a pace to those sounds. Is that, that's on, is that on purpose? Totally. Yeah, we're, I think that's one of our main tools that we play with is the rhythm and um, finding, the, you know, finding the right rhythm or the good, a, a nice order for things to kind of sit in. Um, and uh, oftentimes it work. It's working with the music, but I think in, even without music, you're 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 looking for rhythm, especially when there's a, you know, hits right. and explosions. There's the certain kind of sequence of that you want to kind of sell. So f what this uh, this section we just played of the effects, we mm -hmm. heard the bifrost, we heard um, some fighting sounds, we heard Stormbreaker whooshing and chopping. Um, so those are kind of the milestones, or or not the milestones, but the the pillars that we that we use to construct this. Right. Um, we start with those type of bigger sounds, and then fill in the other sounds around it. Well, now it occurs to me that like when when Stormbreaker is introduced in uh, Infinity War, mm -hmm. that it has to have some connection to Mjolnir sound wise, but it also has to be its own object, and then that becomes part of its character through the rest of the movies. Am I right? Absolutely. Um, that was a tr really tricky part of this movie, actually, was Stormbreaker, because in Infinity War, the hammer was gone. So we were, we were, t we were using uh, Mjolnir's elements to, you know, changing them, but it was a part of its sound, because it was constructed the same way, and right. it was a, it, you know, it does look different, and it moves a little bit different, but it, we wanted that familiarity, familiarity and, uh, um, and now they're both together, and it was a, it was a puzzle for us because we because we needed them to sound very different, you know. So that they you had don't, that, so that you know which one you're yeah, hearing, you yeah. Know, Mjolnir and Stormbreaker, and so a lot of it was uh, finding Stormbreakers, um, well, just elements to differentiate them. For the the way we did it was uh, using Mjolnir's tone mm -hmm. to kind of sell that that it was Mjolnir. So we right. emphasized the tone a lot more, the tonal me metallic kind of hits. And then for Stormbreaker, we used we emphasized these low, um, ripping kind of whooshes and slices and chops, and that was kind of what helped us separate them. Uh, Does Mjolnir have a slightly different sound because it's been reassembled? Oh, Does it have um, a, a little rattle on its edge or something. <laughs> well, that's a good idea. <laughs> we could have pitched that. <laughs> well, I love the sound of it reassembling. The ding, 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 ding. Yeah. I mean, that had to be. I was thinking to myself, "Wow, that's a brand new sound in the MCU." Yeah. Which means you could create it from whole cloth, but if you get it wrong, everyone's gonna know. Right. That those are that's real stakes. Yeah, it was a that was a tricky little challenge. I think the. Um, the reassembling, though, it did it did make sense to me. There was a there was a clear idea of what it kind of should be. Mm -hmm. like it should be a it's it seemed like it should be this rhythmic kind of repeating metal small pieces um, kind of locking together. So right. you have this rhythmic kind of uh, metal hits, and then at the end of it, 
um, there's a big traditional hammer hit, and that right. signifies it coming back together. We, I think, it, yeah, we we wanted to keep it though, even though it was. It, it, it is a slightly different Mjolnir now. Yeah. We wanted to keep the sounds the same as they had been before for when it's just in its full form because um, it's the sound that Thor recognizes and it's his long lost hammer that he, you know, he really misses. Well, and yet, interestingly, I think this is the first time we've seen Mjolnir. Well, no, we saw Cap flinging it around, but it's mm. very much this strange new experience of Thor hearing Mjolnir. Mm -hmm. We're always used to seeing him in control or. Yeah. Simpatico with it. So I'm curious that that must also be an element you're playing with within the narrative. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, just finding that sound, the hammer sound, that was the kind of the purest form of it, this purest kind of ring that we uh, stretched out, kind of made Dopplers of, and so we could it, it could be recognizable. So even as the audience, you could recognize that sound because it's a great sound. Yeah. Um, it's a really familiar sound and um, now the other familiar sound I hear in here, and I hear it in movies all the time, is that sort of splat of something going through the enemy. <laughs> and there, there's got to be about a million different ways to make that sound. Yeah, there's a lot of different ways. Um, what are the prime components of a of the of, of the fleshy of the, of the splat the flesh. Of, <laughs> of death? <laughs> yeah, the gore. Uh, well, uh, you start off with a hit. It has mm -hmm. to be have a, a kind of a, a punching element that you can punctuate it with. Right. And then uh, after that, you start layering sound, layering in sounds of, uh, I mean, it, it, it could be gore, but it could be, you know, there were some like pig gut recordings that someone did or Smacking some just- them on the ground. Yeah, and, yeah. there was a lot of mud that we, that had, it, it worked for the, the bigger pieces of the, the gore because it's kind of chunkier and more substantial. It yeah. couldn't be water. It had to be kind of more fleshy. Weighty. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, there's a. I mean, if I typed in flesh into the Skywalker library, you'd probably get like seventeen thousand files. So you have just to sort through and. Um, but yeah, that's always a lot of fun. Amazing, <laughs> the head exploding from scanners. Yeah. <laughs> we were talking earlier about the T Rex sound harking to real anatomy. Um, how do you go about creating new monster sounds? These are new monsters. These are brand new monsters. We've never seen them before. Um, these monsters are. Uh, they're a huge mix of this this species. There wasn't the direction was it wasn't they didn't see, need to all kind of share a similar type of uh, thing because they're so different from one another. Hmm. So there's just a huge pool of monster vocals, and we made new monster sounds. We grabbed sounds that were unused from other things that had been. I mean, it's just a massive amount. Okay, so now I'm kind of curious about that whole process. You you're working on this film, and it's revealed to you. Okay, there's going to be a whole bunch of monsters in this scene. Here's some renderings of what they're going to look like. Yeah. What is your first step with creating a voice for those monsters? I think it's to do a lot of listening and find out what. I mean, they, you're you're right. They send a whole bunch of images of what some of these monsters are. Um, we didn't see a lot of what these monsters are for a long were for a long time. So it was a work in progress for throughout the project. Um, each new version that came in, maybe one had one that was rendered a little bit more, and right. then you'd. Um, but it's it's a lot just visually what your um, what your first instinct is yeah. when you're looking at it. Okay. Yeah, your instinct and your you, you know just a lot of listening and seeing what's working with those. You know, your eye latches onto a certain a certain element of the monster. Yeah. Like certain some of these are a little bit more bug like, and um, so we tried to add in sounds that were a little bit more um, you know. Uh, Centipede kind of sure. bass, you know, higher pitched, uh, screamier. And so you might start just by throwing in some sounds from the library into the shot and just watching how it feels when it, when it plays. Yeah, and a lot of collecting. We have spotting lists where we just bring in a whole bunch of sounds. I think that might wouldn't work. I think that might work. And it's the sounds that uh, seem to be in the right vein. And then when you start using them, then you can hone them in a little bit more and say, okay, well, I think we need to delve into this for this one a little bit more for this particular monster. There was one in particular that they they uh, fixated on. They really wanted it to be, um, the, they, they were, it's after uh, Thor, it gets, it, it gets his attention from behind us, which is why they wanted, they wanted, they, it was a big deal for them. They had this right. massive monster that was bigger than the rest of them. And we went through a lot of versions on this to see.
So that monster was, that was a lot of versions for that guy. <laughs> That's lovely. And yeah. I mean, how many different sounds might make up his voice? Like five or 20 or it just depends shot to shot? Yeah, because he's so much bigger, um, it usually takes some level, in my experience, some level of layering right. to kind of get that size. But I would say definitely no more than, uh, you know, you if you layer too many sounds in together, then it starts kind of becoming mush and you, you stop the definition of the whatever tone that you, or whatever his voice is, it kind of becomes a little bit washed out. Right, so like you, in every painting, uh, you're gonna end up with brown if you go too far. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you just want to, you want to find that one element and then have it supported in a way where it's, uh, um, it seems like his his voice, that monster's voice, but I, it's hard to answer that question though. But it's, it's, it's a mix of sounds yeah. for sure. It's, there, I just hadn't wrapped my head around how constructivist it is, how additive the process really is. It's amazing. Yeah, it really is. It's a it's a big, I mean, this whole scene, there's um, there's just so many things in this scene. You know, there's the weapons, and then there's the fighting, there's the backgrounds, there's the fire, um, and, um, you know, our, our Mjolnir, it's Mjolnir's new move. Um, so that's a, it's a big, a lot of time, a lot of construction. So these are some of the sounds I'm just gonna uh, kind of pick apart some of the sounds of the hammer as it comes a comes apart. And so that's kind of the the break the break off. Um, right. And there's kind of this, which is like a different ring than Mjolnir's normal ring. That's true. Yeah. That we we were kind of tr we were, we wanted to have it be familiar. Yeah. But also sound like it's a new thing. So we part of doing that was manipulating the legacy sounds in ways. You know, finding a patterns of hits and delays and then and then also introducing some new elements mm -hmm. some kind of delay and um, these uh, you know sounds to mark all the pieces coming apart I would imagine with all this listening that you have to do um, the term you know the term for when you hear a word so many times it becomes meaningless is semantic satiation semantic you must satiation. get your own kind of semantic satiation with some of these do you go to a colleague next door and say can you come take a look at this yeah I love that's a great part of it every time someone comes in and I mean even you you hear now I'm like oh okay well, I could have done that a little bit differently but yeah you, you get a new perspective you, you yeah. immediately step out of this chair just with somebody else in the room is my experience. And that's why I think it's really valuable to have other people uh, listen and critique when you go to the mix. Right. Um, it, that's a huge part of that is the, the mixer will kind of assess the sounds on a level that you ha that maybe you haven't been focusing on. Right. And um, it's a helpful, I think it's really uh, beneficial to making it clear and uh, good, good stuff. Amazing, can we hear that again? Yeah. Yeah, we mix a lot of, that's just one little layer. There's another hit layer, there's whoosh layers. But that's, we uh, mix in a lot of ricochets and bullet hits. Um, that was one of the notes on the final was to, they wanted to make it sound like there was just millions of, or not millions, but uh, dozens of these things flying around, ripping through. Shards. And so we, yeah, exactly. So that was one of the fixes we added was these, these ricochets and more hits than you actually even see just to get that sense that these things are ripping through all these different creatures. Let's see, I can play you the sound of it coming back together. Yeah. Oh, that last bit, the doom, the down sound. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's, it's a, uh, that was, yeah, you know, we, that was that rhythmic kind of idea. And then we, when they lock in that, it's just a traditional, Nice traditional chunky hammer hit that kind of signifies um, Mjolnir's back kind of thing. Now the rhythm of those pieces assembling, is that something that you and like the CG artist mm. gave it a rhythm? Did they tell you what that rhythm was? No, they so didn't. So you, you figured out after, you, you, ver you reverse engineer it. Yeah, in a way. I mean, you, you know, you have to work with the, with, within the constraints of what they give you, for sure. Right. But having said that, those metal hits aren't perfectly synced to 
what you're seeing. It's, I was it's, wondering. Yeah, it's more it's more about the the rhythm of it. It's wow. the the rhythm of how it should because otherwise it'd probably be you know this really weird <laughs> rhythm that <laughs> yeah. that was kind of maybe a little disjointed and it didn't have the same impact. But yeah, it's right. very it's very uh, rhythmic. Just. But also the rhythmic has a, it gives a character to Mjolnir. Mjolnir knows what's going on. Mjolnir's putting itself back together. Totally. So of course it would happen on a, that's a like great that's point. a character move. Right? right, that's a great point. Yeah, it has to be, it's, this is, it's meant, meant to happen here. This is, it's doing its move. It's not, it's not, you know, something's not affecting it in some way. So is that someone with a pair of drumsticks with a little tape on them <laughs> tapping on a piece of steel? <laughs> um, that's a, this just uh, some metal hits that I was searching for that I had uh, kind of collected. And um, I start. I f first started with some actual hammer hits from before, mm -hmm. um, and assembled those in a way. But they just weren't working for some reason. I think it needed to be a little smaller, and uh, they're a little bit ringier. And yeah. uh, these are the, and then all together, or maybe it's a little lower, something like that. Yeah, that's mostly, there are other elements in there to kind of beef it up, and uh, there's all these other whizzing kind of sounds to signify the pieces coming in, but th that's kind of the meat of the coming together sound. <laughs> I'm realizing that you're like the Elton John to the film's Bernie Taupin. They deliver you the lyrics and you have to put the music to it. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Elton John. Okay, I can I can live with that. I think. <laughs> um, I I am curious if you ever find a scene where the actual edit you might you might even say you know we could use an extra half second on the end of this shot in order to get the rhythm better. Is that the contribution you guys might make to the edit? Um, the, great question. Um, I think it depends. It depends on your relationship with the filmmaker. Sure. Um, for this one, I wouldn't feel comfortable. Suggesting that, mm -hmm. but um, I totally know what you're saying because sometimes things are cut so tightly where it's really hard to give it a little bit of room or a little bit of breathing and finding the the right rhythm for something. But the picture editors, they and the director, you know, um, they're looking for those things too. You know, there's right. some great look picture editors are they're cutting even cutting with sound with sounds you provided or with their own and they're. You, they they have that rhythm in their head, you know. Right, so they're right, they're helping right. you um, most of the time, yeah. So it might show up later as sort of like a problem you're all trying to solve together because it's mostly done, but something's not quite working. And totally, oh, that's amazing. Oh, totally, no, that happened on this movie. I'm I'm sure it did. Uh, that that they are on the final stage. We're putting everything together, and um, something isn't playing quite right. And they had in this case they had a an edit station right in the back of the mix stage and. They would just go back there if they if they wanted to tweak something that something wasn't working the way that because there it's a different experience when you're on the stage it, it feels like a movie you know right, and, right. Um, so yeah it's definitely make adjustments based on that that's fascinating I, I find myself not surprised that that happens but I'm surprised that you're ever able to finish <laughs> I mean given the number of elements and the number of seconds in this movie each one having so many sounds to it I'm just overwhelmed by the amount of work yeah it's a lot of work it's a lot of meticulous work. Um, but it's a lot of fun. I really enjoy it. Yeah.